In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading for today is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 48. We continue to hear the history of the early Christian church. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Our second reading is from John chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. 
For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading for today is from John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whoever you ask, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The word of God I'd like to direct our attention to today is our gospel reading from John chapter 15, beginning at verse 9. It's a very beautiful and powerful passage of scripture, and I'd like to read it again. Please listen carefully uh, listen for the word love and how that love is connected and interrelated because there's really sort of a web of love that's being talked about here. <clears throat> As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. There's an awful lot of different kinds of love in the world. And we talk a lot about love, but in this day and age, I don't know if we really understand what the word means. Uh, after all, I love popcorn. Perhaps you love pizza. We're, we're well into spring and maybe you love spring. Maybe you believe in love at first sight. Perhaps when you're renovating, you go to the store and look at paint chips to hear your wife say, oh, I love this color. Now, is that really what love is? Or is that just sort of mean I really like? They are two different things. You see, love is not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's not just the uh, maybe the, the sparks that fly, or maybe the sparks that flew when you first met the person who later became your spouse. Love is not that shallow. It's not that simple. It's not that simplistic. I wonder sometimes if we really understand what love is. And maybe with today being Mother's Day, that would be a, a good place to start at least to gain a deeper appreciation of what love really is. Because uh, as we think about a mother's love for a child, for her child, that's, that's the kind of love that keeps her up 
until 11 p.m. for the last feeding of the day for that little newborn baby. It's the love that gets her up two hours later to feed him again, and two hours after that to feed him again, and two hours after that to deal with a very full diaper, feed him again, and two hours after that to do it again, and then to do the whole thing through the next day and the next night, sometime for weeks and months on end. You wouldn't talk about a mother's love like this. Uh, you wouldn't have the mother laying in bed, middle of the night, baby crying away, and the mother says, boy, I sure love that crying baby. I'm going back to sleep now. See, love is an action when we talk about a mother's love, right? And, and isn't a mother willing to pretty much do anything for her child? Uh, we hear all kinds of stories of mothers and, and fathers, but running into burning buildings, uh, running back to cars that are on fire, digging through rubble with, in fact, I remember hearing about a, a woman whose child was trapped under a car and she picked up the car so someone could pull the child out from underneath. Now how that happens, I don't know, but certainly not a mother I'm gonna mess with. We hear these stories of love, powerful stories, actions, love in action. And that reminds us, that shows us, that gives a, a little picture of what God's love for us is like in Jesus. It's not just a trivial thing. It is a, a deep and powerful thing. It is a love that, that drove Jesus to come to earth, to live among us, to, to humble himself, to give up the power and authority that he had as the Son of God, to walk among us, to be hot, to be thirsty, to be hungry, to be beaten, to suffer, and to die. And in what he did for us, we see love. Love that is an action. And God calls us, as ones who are loved, to love others. We hear these words again from our reading. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Notice, what we're talking about here is, it's God's direction to us, it's the words of Jesus to us. He says it's his commandment to us, but notice where it starts. Because we would, we would tend to think it starts with the first part of the sentence. Love one another. Right? Like, this is a, a, this is a thing that Christ is putting on us as something we have to do. Uh, it's, another, it's another thing we have to strive for. And, and it's, it's like it's up to us to do that. But really, that's not, that's not where it starts. The whole, the whole thing, the whole web of love starts somewhere else. Listen as I read that sentence again. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Do you see that? Do you notice it? It's not that we have to love and we have to try hard to love. And maybe there's some people we have to try really hard to love. But we need to remember and we need to, to start with God's love for us, with the way Jesus loved and loves us. See, it all starts not with us, not in our hearts, not with our attempts, not with our trying. It all starts with Jesus' love for us. And then in that love and knowing that love, and, and having a deep appreciation, an understanding for that love, then we are empowered to go out and to love others. We are loved by the, the king of the universe, the creator of all things, who was like so, so high above us, but yet came down and humbled himself to live among us, Loved us not because he saw great potential in us. In fact, in Romans 8, 5, it says, sorry, Romans 5, 8. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He lifted us up in bringing himself down. And he treated us way better than, than we deserve. We deserve death. We deserve punishment. We were God's enemies. And in that time, Jesus came and gave himself for us, made us God's children, showed us incredible love, and now gives us the privilege of sharing that love with others. I had kind of an example of that uh, quite a few years ago. There was uh, some meetings I was going to. It was in Edmonton. And I got to know one of the gentlemen. He was maybe 15, yeah, probably 15 years older than I was at the time. Uh, really nice guy, you know, down to earth kind of guy. I, I thought he was, you know, maybe a, I thought he was a teacher or a farmer or, you know, like he was just, he was just a nice guy. And as I got to know him and, and as other people, you know, I got to visit with other people in the group and they told me, uh, actually, he wasn't a teacher. He wasn't a farmer. He wasn't, he wasn't a regular guy. He owned a fairly large oil field maintenance and supply company with three locations in Alberta. And apparently the previous year, uh, his, his personal income, not the company income, his personal income was $5 million. He had a really nice, I remember the one time, he had a really nice camel hair, you know, three quarter length or full length coat, whatever you'd call it. Uh, I took a look online afterwards. His coat was probably worth more than my car. Anyway, one day uh, I was riding with him uh, on the way to the meetings, uh, he, he arranged special to pick me up in his Porsche. And uh, as we pulled up to the hotel that we were staying in, uh, he dropped myself and the luggage off and I waited till he went and parked and went into the lobby of the hotel. And we were greeted by the, the doorman, uh, who was a, a gentleman. Uh, he, was, he was an immigrant to Canada. His English was reasonably good, but I mean, if you, I worked in a hotel, okay? And so I kind of know there's a hierarchy, right? You, you got the cleaning staff. Uh, they're kind of, they're on the bottom. People don't give them a lot of respect or treat them very well. And then you slowly work your way up. You know, probably doorman might be next. Uh, then the front desk people and then management. Well, this friend of mine uh, greeted the doorman like they were old friends. And, you know, I, I think they were. And he asked him about his wife and his children. Uh, and you could tell he was sincere in his interest and, and in how this man was doing. And he received back from this gentleman uh, friendship, I guess. And, and that impressed me because someone who's that successful, you know, someone who's that important in the eyes of the world could very easily just walk by someone like that, not even give them the time of day. But because everyone was important to this man, because in his faith, he knew he was important to God. He treated this man with, with respect. And that, that made a powerful impression on me. Just imagine what it would be like. Actually, just imagine what it's like when God himself comes to us and greets us like old friends. Who cares about us? Who cares for us? Who wants to know how we're doing? Who wants to spend time with people like us? Unimportant people, powerless people, sinful people. And that's exactly what God did in Christ. And what he continues to do each and every day of our lives. He has called us in love. And he has poured that love into our hearts and into our lives so that love can overflow onto others. And so, as we remember God's love for us, we can share that love with those around us. Now, there's one thing you should probably know. That's a whole lot easier to say than to do, isn't it? Isn't it true that 
Uh, there are people in our lives, uh, people in our neighborhood, maybe even people in our congregation that are not always that easy to love. And aren't there times when we don't really feel like being very loving and it kind of doesn't matter to who. We're just having a bad day. We're focused on ourselves. And we just, we don't feel like it. Although love sounds easy, we know it's not. And that's why we need to come together to hear of God's love for us, to be, to be picked up, straightened out perhaps, and sent out again into the world, refreshed, revitalized, reminded of God's love for us, so that love can pour out onto others, so that we can share the gift we have with those around us, and so that we can bear fruit, so that as others see us and see how we treat them and, and how we treat others, that they too may come to know Christ's love for us. I want to conclude with a, a story. It's a true story about someone you've probably never heard of. His name is Peter Miller, and he lived around the same time as somebody you probably have heard of, and that was some guy named George Washington. Uh, this Peter Miller was a pastor, and he knew George Washington back in the days when George was just a general. And Peter had, had done a lot to the cause of uh, freedom from British rule. And, and he and George got along very well. Pastor Miller lived in a town called Ephratha, Pennsylvania. And in that town was another man named Michael Whitman. Now, Michael Whitman was not a nice guy okay he was you in fact george washington at one point said he's evil and he was a man who uh, not only was miserable to most people around him but in particular he was miserable to this pastor and he did everything he could to undermine the ministry of this man uh, he spread rumors he spoke against him at every opportunity in fact we're told at one point uh, he even physically assaulted him. And this... Michael Whitman... I'm getting my people mixed up. Michael Whitman also had one other thing, one other strike against him. And that is the fact that he supported British rule in what would become the United States of America. And he relayed uh, troop movement and other sorts of information to the British in the hope that the uprising would be put down. Eventually, he was arrested and tried and convicted of treason. Peter Miller heard about this and walked the 70 miles to Philadelphia and asked to talk to George Washington. He talked to Washington and he said, I understand that Michael Whitman has been sentenced to hang for treason. Washington said, that's true. And then he asked, as a personal favor, would you please give him a pardon? And Washington said, I can't do that. This is, this is too serious, and we need to carry out the sentence we passed. He said, I'm sorry, I cannot pardon your friend. To which Pastor Miller said, oh, he's not my friend. In fact, he would probably consider himself my number one enemy. And Washington said, then why are you here asking for a pardon? He doesn't deserve it. Pastor Miller said, I'm here because I did not deserve to be pardoned. And yet that is what God has done for me in Jesus. Washington thought about it for a few moments, went to the other room, and came back with a pardon. That evening, Peter Miller and Michael Whitman walked back to Ephrathah together. 
And what had happened changed Michael. And he and this pastor became friends until their life's end. The action of love for an enemy saved his life. The story could have ended very differently. And if you think about it, for us, our story should have ended very differently as well because we were no friends of God until he came to us, until he, in love, came down to give himself for us for the forgiveness of our sins and to call us to be his children. He showed us what love is so that we can show love to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. We now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have several prayer requests for today. The first one is for Wendy Lee, who will be going for testing and to see a specialist in the next couple of weeks. We want to pray for Val Wallace, who is in hospital with an intestinal blockage. For Kirsten Hess, as she continues her cancer treatment. And down at Faith and Courtney, we want to continue to remember Ron Zimmer as he continues his cancer treatments. We want to pray for Ron Harding, who tripped this last week and fell and hurt his shoulder. We also want to pray for Arlene's aunt, Selma, back in Ontario, who suffered a fall and a slight fracture of her hip. They're hoping it will heal on its own and that she will not require surgery. We also want to remember uh, the Lutheran Church in Tomahawk, Alberta, and its many members and the people in the community there already is wildfires burning there, and it seems to be growing and spreading quite quickly. And finally then, we want to remember and give thanks to God for the gift of Christian mothers. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Lord, Almighty Father, we pray that you would be with Wendy Lee in these days ahead, that you would give her calm and peace, that you would give her relief from worry. Lord, we pray that as she undergoes these tests, you'd be with her and that you'd give your wisdom to the doctors, that they would be able to discover what's going on and have the skills and abilities to treat her successfully. We also pray that you'd be with her family at this time as they worry about her and go through these things with her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for being with Val and for the care that she is receiving in hospital. We pray that the treatment she's receiving would be successful and that she'd very soon be able to return home. Be with her, give her your patience, give her strength. Be with her family as they care for her and worry about her as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you'd be with Kirsten and with Ron as they continue their cancer treatments. Lord, we pray that your blessing would be in the medication that they're taking, that the treatment and care they're receiving would push their cancer into remission. We ask, Lord, that you would give them protection from side effects, that you'd be with their families as they worry about them. Give them your strength and your comfort at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for being with Ron, even in his fall, and that you protected him from even further harm. 
We pray that you would be with him now and bring healing to him, that you'd guide the doctors as they continue to care for him. And Lord, we pray that he would very quickly be restored to mobility and to strength in his shoulder. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to be with him and with Arlene as they work together to do the things that need to be done this time of year, that you would give them patience and that you would give your wisdom to the doctors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also ask, Lord, that you'd be with Arlene's aunt, Selma, and that we thank you that you had kept her from further harm. We pray, Lord, that her hip would heal on its own and that she would not require surgery. Be with her family and friends and those that care for her, that your healing hand would be at work through them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would be with the members of our sister congregation in Tomahawk, Alberta, and with the people in their community and area as wildfires are, are spreading. We pray, Lord, that you would grant rain to help bring the fires under control, that you give protection to the people and the properties in that area, that you would watch over and protect the firefighters and all the people who are working to bring this under control. We pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe in the work they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Christian mothers, for women who love their children, care for them, and bring them up in the faith. We pray that you would give them wisdom in all things, that they would be able to shine the light of God's love into the lives of their children, to share the forgiveness that they have with those entrusted to their care. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.